My name is Erle Nilsen. I'm a project leader of the Living Norway Ecological Data Network. And uh, in this first session now, we will have several presentations from uh, friends and colleagues from the network that will present much more in detail what we are planning to do, what are our goals, our visions, and the way, the more technical ways that we see this is moving forward. So for me, I will just give a more of a general introduction to the, to the topic. And uh, if you think of this uh, as, a, as a paper, this will sort of be the introduction to the paper, and then the others will present the methods and the results and discussions and so on. Uh, we are living in a time where science is probably stronger tied to political developments than ever before, I think. And this was discussed in the last week's editorial in Nature. Uh, this applies both in terms of how funding and research policy priorities are, are going and conducted. Uh, and uh, I think that the global coronavirus pandemic has highlighted this, how interdependent these, these, uh, these two enterprises are. Uh, and it's also clear that sometimes politicians have the power to overlook and neglect scientific evidence when making decisions. Uh, and we have seen that how the political situation some places in the world uh, are uh, making it uh, tricky to, 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 to come across with scientific findings and so on. So I think in these times, openness around the processes that we, are, that we as scientists are part of when we are conducting science is more important than ever that we are open around these processes. As you all know, we live in a world where the landscapes, the biosphere, the atmosphere, and so on, are heavily affected by human activities. Uh, and this is commonly now and more or less accepted, that this represents a new epoch, starting sometimes in the 40s, 50s, 60s. And this is our epoch, where the biosphere is strongly modified and affected by human activities. So this affects the way we are doing applied ecology or apply, uh, ecology these days. Of course, Charles Darwin, 160 years ago roughly, when he wrote and published his book about the origin of the species, he described how the tree of life had evolved over long geological timescales and uh, resulting in the species that we can observe today. And many of the species we haven't even observed and uh, described. But we also know that much of this tree of life, the distribution, the abundance uh, and the existence of species is changing. It's under threat from, from uh, human activities and anthropogenic pressures. Many of you will recognize the figure to the left as coming from the summary report for, from the last year's uh, report from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the IPES uh, panel, which describes how the different biomes have been affected by various, uh, various uh, human activities. The figure to the, to the right is from the relatively re recent Living Planet report uh, that came out this year with the title Bending the Curve of Biodiversity Loss. And this one depicts the Global Living Planet Index from 1970 up until 2016 and shows that for the species populations that are included in this, in this uh, uh, index, the mean abundance has decreased with r roughly 68% over this, this time period. So this is part of doing applied ecology uh, these days. This is also part of doing uh, applied ecology these days, that the World Economic Forum has identified bi the biodiversity cri crisis and the loss of biodiversity among the top five uh, risk factors for the next 10 years. 
So what we are, uh, when we are working as ecologists these days, of course, many of us got into this uh, for, from a fundamental interest for, for the nature and, and processes and uh, yeah, uh, natural history reasons and so on. But it has really a fundamental societal, societal uh, uh, value, the work and the research we are doing. And just to reiterate, I mean, ecology, it has many definitions. One of uh, me as a background, uh, as a vertebrate uh, biologist, working with mainly with mammals, birds, population ecology, population dynamics. I like this uh, definition of ecology. It says that ecology is the scientific study of the interactions that determine the distribution and abundance of organisms. This goes back to uh, Charlie Krebs, 1972. And there are many other definitions also. But this one tells us that ecology is about understanding the processes that So, if you think back to the two former slides, this puts ecology and applied ecology really at the center stage of the societal uh, challenges these days. We need to understand the processes and the interactions that determine the distribution and abundance of the organisms that live on the planet. Ecological research takes place in a lot of different spatial scales. A lot of the research that is reported in papers uh, and in reports and, and, and so on takes place on a relatively small scale. It happens on local scales or on a landscape scale. Uh, also, most of the research that we report is used is observational. It's not based on experiments. So this is the data at hand when we are trying to solve the big uh, questions and big challenges. And of course, it's a lot of value in the small scale uh, work. I've been doing that uh, myself for in many many cases, and there is a lot of value in that. But sometimes we need to also be able to to scale up to understand the processes at larger scales. In many cases, this means that we need to integrate and merge data from several disparate uh, data select or collection processes, from different research programs, from different monitoring programs. And these days, the statistical machinery to do so is developing uh, quickly. Uh, there's a lot of research now going into data integration uh, models, statistical data integration, uh, integrated population models, integrated uh, species distribution models, and so on. And the cornerstone here is to use data from different programs, from dif different data sets, integrate them into common statistical framework, and get more out of the data at hand, more than you can learn from separate analysis of the, dis the, the separate um, uh, data sets. To make this efficient on a larger scale than it's currently done, we need to mobilize, make available a much larger uh, body of the data that is actually collected and is uh, available out there. This small example here just show how, for instance, in Norway, you have two different sources of large-scale data for for uh, willow ptarmigan um, abundance distribution. There is a line transect distance sampling survey data on the, on the left side of the country. And then, then there is occurrence data from citizen science projects. These are different data sources. They can, and we, we are do doing so, integrating them in, this, in the common statistic uh, uh, frameworks. But to do so if efficiently and for more cases, we need to have them interoperable in the same, in the same, uh, in the same uh, formats and they need to be available for fellow scientists. Yeah, so open science 
in applied ecology, open science and open data. We will hear much more about open science later today. We'll have a couple of talks specifically uh, on, uh, on uh, this. But uh, in general, uh, again, there are many definitions. But in general, open science can be defined as a movement to make scientific research, data, and dissemination accessible to all levels of an inquiring society. So it means, about, means you're opening up the process of doing research, opening up data, opening up uh, the, the results published in, in papers, opening up access to, to your uh, computer code, and so on and so forth. And one of the things that open science can do is to help us reduce research waste. It can help us uh, target the correct questions, and it can help us in a much better way delivering uh, scientific results that can be used by society at, at large. I will not go through all the details here. It was summarized in a paper we had this year with Matt Granger, which we'll present later today. It's the first author on, where we reported how open science, open data can help us reduce research waste at several levels. And of course, open data is a central part of open science. Um, by making the research data um, and monitoring data available to, to other, uh, to the society, there is a lot, lot of, uh, lot of benef benef benefits to that. It includes things like verification of published results. It's hard to verify published results if your fellows cannot access your data and your computer code. It creates the foundation for better, better meta-analysis that we will hear more about later today. It provides possibilities to test new, new questions that are not necessarily um, put forward by the PI and the, and, the, and the person that collected the data. It has the potential to increase citation rates and credit to those that provide data if it's done in a correct and a good, good way. It provides new teaching opportunities. It reduces the risk of data loss. And yeah, all of these were uh, included in the, in the important and nice paper by Whitlock in 2011. And I've added a couple of more here. It makes it possible to integrate data across larger spatio-temporal domains, which is very important these days with when we are doing these large-scale uh, assessments. It increases the efficiency. We are spending these days a lot of time to find them compile and set, set together uh, ecological data in all research projects, and the next research project typically do the same. And it should increase trust and transparency in the process. And of course, everybody is uh, expecting open data these days. Public bodies write about this, research funders do so, journals all expect open data, which is good. But the current practice is very, very fragmented. There are few clear guidelines on how we do this. People are doing it in very different ways, sometimes in efficient uh, uh, ways that makes the data reusable by others, and sometimes in less efficient ways. So this is what m many fellow researchers, many ecologists uh, meet. They, can, they support the ID, the principles, but basically, a lot of people don't know exactly how we do this in the best, best way. And there has been some surveys uh, of the current situation. How well are we doing when it comes to, to uh, making code data available? And how reusable are the data and the code that are there? We will hear more about this uh, just after the lunch. But here are three examples of paper that do touch upon this question. Uh, and in general, I think the conclusion is that, that there is uh, scope for improvement, without doubt. Fair data is a concept that many of you will have be familiar with. 
This will again be discussed, presented more in detail later today. It basically means that when you publish, archive your data, they should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. There are some clear technical guidelines here, but I think one thing that is often uh, forgotten is that to do this in the best possible way, it also means that you should, for your data, as long as possible, use standards, established standards, open standards, to make them more interoperable and more reusable by your fellow uh, researchers and the society as such. Anders Finsta will talk more about this after, but this is a very important part if you want to make the most out of, out of the, the process. Yeah, there has been uh, some surveys, uh, quite a few in, the, in different uh, contexts about what people, uh, uh, how re researchers uh, report or, or find uh, obstacles to public data sharing. And uh, this one specific one is conducted by Springer Nature, uh, published in 2018. And in this case, the researcher that responded to this pointed to three, three to four main, main uh, obstacles. One was how to organize the data in a presentable and usable way. So a lot of, of researchers don't know exactly how to do this, which is not surprising. Not knowing which repository to use is another central one. Unsure about copyrights and licensing issues is another central one. And lack of time to deposit data. We will touch upon many of these in the talks later today and how we can uh, reduce these barriers. So, tuning into what we are up to in the Living Norway Ecological Data Network. We will have a couple of more talks before lunch now about more detailed um, plans and uh, visions and uh, technicalities about how we hope to help uh, on this situation. But the main objective of our network and uh, the infrastructure we are building is to make accessible, standardized, and documented data from field-based ecological research and monitoring. And then we think that we need to do a lot of different activities to achieve this. Currently, the network ex consists of uh, eight Norwegian uh, institutes that are, are listed, uh, listed here. And we should point out that we are tightly connected to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, GBIF. We build on the same standards which Anders will talk more about, uh, Anders Finsta will talk more about later, and we build on the same underlying infrastructure for making data available. So in a way, we are trying to expand the, the focus uh, and, the, and the applicability of the, of, the, of the Darwin Core Standard and, and this data flow to cover also ecological data to a larger extent. We think that we need to do so well by focusing on harmon data harmonization, standardization for ecological data. We will do so by contribute to the international and we will have a lot of focus on education and training of students and researchers in modern data management and ethics related to use and provision of open of various national and international frameworks. So to sum up, before you give, give much more details about what we are up to, uh, I will just take the quick summary. We see that the need for ecological research is real, global, and unquestionable. We see that the scale of the challenges we are up to uh, in society requires large-scale collaborations, efficient use of resources and research practices that build trust around the research uh, and the evidence base. And basically the Living Norway data, Ecological Data Network is our response to many of these challenges. 
And I would like to end with a small note that targeted actions can help. This paper was published last year by uh, Frederica Bolland and, uh, and co-workers, and they used expert elicitation to, to see how many species during the, the since 1993, roughly, has been birds and mammals, was saved from extinction by conservation actions. And as you can see here on the, on the graph, actually there has been some su success stories as well. They conclude that uh, it's time to increase the, the effort to save more species, but of course it's also nice to see that sometimes the targeted actions we do can help. So with that, uh, we'll end my presentation.